<clears throat> Welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Damon Wilson, the Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council, and it's my pleasure uh, to welcome all of you for our event, the European Neighborhood Policy, Eastern Partnerships 10th Anniversary. Uh, we're going to be live streaming today's event, a lot of live coverage as well, so I want to welcome all of those in the room, but also online, to join in the discussion using the hashtag AC Eurasia. I'd like to also just offer a special welcome, uh, a special thanks to our partner in this endeavor, the European Commission, for their support to make this conference possible. We're delighted to be partnering you, with you on this today. Um, it's a terrific opportunity to partner with the EU on the occasion of the spring meetings of the IMF and the World Bank to welcome uh, Commissioner Johannes Hahn back to Washington, back to the Atlantic Council for this occasion. Minister Teodorovic, we're delighted to have you uh, with us for this as well. Uh, and so many others from the Eastern Partnership Nations, our colleagues, Katerina, Michael from the Commission as well, who've been terrific in helping to set this up. So I think many of you in this room know about the Eastern Partnership's origins as its launch in 2009, May, in Prague. It was instigated then by foreign ministers of Sweden and Poland, our own International Advisory Board member Carl Bildt, uh, and Radek Sikorsky. Their aim was to integrate the Eastern neighbors with the European Union, a pretty simple concept that proved to be controversial. The Eastern U Partnership is a joint initiative involving the EU, its member states, and of course the six Eastern European partners, many of whom we'll hear from today, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Belarus, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. It was established to enhance the political association and economic integration of the six countries within the EU. Indeed, the Eastern Partnership was a strategic response to what I consider a strategic failure in our own strategy of advancing a Europe whole, free, and at peace. It was in 2008, after all, when NATO members at their Bucharest summit failed to agree on a roadmap for Georgia and Ukraine, even as they embraced the aspirations that one day these nations would become members. The invasion of Georgia followed that August. So it's in this strategic vacuum that the European Union stepped in with an answer, the Eastern Partnership. Many in this town were skeptical. Many in European capitals were skeptical at the time. I was called before Congress to testify on the Eastern Partnership several years ago to a skeptical audience, and I made the case there, and I'll just read from that testimony, that the Eastern Partnership holds the potential to be a driver of reform as it offers these six post-Soviet nations three enticing elements, political affiliation with the EU through the association agreements, economic integration through deep and comprehensive free trade agreements, and the elimination of barriers to travel through liberalization of visa policies. But to unpack that, in essence, these are the ingredients to accelerate the adoption of European norms and values in these nations, creating facts on the ground in which individual choices shape a country's strategic direction. The enduring strength of the Eastern Partnership, I think, is that success is driven by attraction, not by coercion. And its powerful unspoken premise is that true sovereignty actually requires more democracy. So 10 years in, three of these countries, Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, have concluded association agreements, including deep and comprehensive free trade agreements. The EU's granted visa-free travel. So today we're here to consider to what extent the partnership's been successful. Has the project benefited both sides? In what ways? What's worked? What's still missing? What's the future of the partnership as we look at the second decade? This event for us at the Atlantic Council is part of a broader body of work that our Eurasia Center has been driving forward, focused on Eastern partnership countries. Many of you were here last fall when we hosted the conference championing the frontiers of freedom, erasing this sense of a gray zone and underscoring that this is where the front line of freedom is today. So to kick us off, I have the pleasure and privilege of introducing uh, two of our speakers who will keynote and anchor the conversation. Um, Commissioner Johannes Hahn, Commissioner for European Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations of the European Commission, and His Excellency uh, Eugen Teodorovic, Minister of Public Finance of Romania, Thank you, both of you, for, for being here and anchoring this event. Commissioner Johannes Hahn has served as the Commissioner for the European Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations since November 2014. Prior to this role, he was the European Commissioner for Regional Policy, and he served as Austria's Federal Minister for Science and Research. 
As all of you know, he's been a driving force in EU policy towards Europe's east. Minister Todorovic is the Minister of Public Finance for the Government of Romania. He's also the European Investment Bank Governor for Romania, previously having served as President of Budget, Finance, Banking, and Capital Markets Committee, Committee, and was the Minister of EU Funds. And Romania has been on the frontiers of helping to flesh out and develop the future of the Eastern Partnership. Each of our guests will give opening remarks, which will be followed by two panel conversations with colleagues that have joined us from the region, from Brussels, uh, and from the uh, international financial institutions here, on both building a stronger economy and then building stronger connectivity and energy within this partnership. So I encourage you to follow along. Hope you enjoy the conversation using hashtag AC Eurasia. And with that, let me invite Commissioner Hahn to the podium, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Damon. Um, excellencies, in particular, um, dear Eugene, uh, we, we have a, a common history because, as you rightly said, uh, he was uh, Minister for the Structural Funds and I was the Commissioner for the Structural Funds. So, and it's uh, therefore a, a particular pleasure to, to see you here today on behalf of the Romanian Presidency um, to address uh, this uh, distinguished audience. Um, uh, indeed, uh, you have already referred to the history. Uh, we are celebrating 10 years of uh, Eastern Partnership uh, in a couple of weeks uh, um, in May, in May, uh, in Brussels. And I think we can really refer to a lot of achievements. It took us some time to, to sort of say, uh, pin down what is needed. And um, you have quoted yourself, and uh, as I said in the preparatory talks, I think you have uh, perfectly summarized uh, what is the aim of uh, this Eastern Partnership. And uh, together with our revised uh, neighborhood policy, which uh, we revised in 2015, uh, and it's not only about the East, it's also about the South, uh, we have been very clear what, uh, what so to say, are the, the main criteria for our relationship with each of our neighbors. And this is uh, to have a tailor-made relationship, to be focused on uh, specific uh, uh, um, items, uh, to have a partnership relation. It's not that we want to impose something, but also have to admit that we pursue our interests as a uh, European Union. It's something which uh, you won't be surprised, or some of you, uh, having in mind that now America First is so uh, prominent on the agenda, um, we are far away from Europe first, but uh, uh, we are starting to begin a little bit by saying uh, what are our interests. And I think it's, it's rather legitimate to, 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 to figure out what are our interests, but it's also that we respect what are the interests of our partner, what are the possibilities uh, and, and opportunities. And therefore, we have to match their interests with our interests. And clearly, our interest is uh, to export stability in order not to import instability. Uh, but it would be a mistake uh, to, to uh, mix stability with, uh, uh, so to say, standstill. Uh, if it's about, for instance, democratic development, rule of law, etc., It means a stability which enables economic development. And we are deeply convinced that economic development leads to more democracy, to uh, more rule of law, to more, in that respect, um, stability, transparency, um, uh, well-functioning judiciary. And uh, these are our goals, because if we look around Europe, is it in the East, is it in the South, there is a huge gap when it comes to the welfare level. Um, uh, for instance, Ukraine, um, a famous example, in 1990, uh, the, the living standard of Poland and Ukraine was the same. Today in Poland it's uh, five, six times higher than in Ukraine and that is why very understandable many Ukrainians, by the way I think today 1.5 million are already working in Poland, compensating by the way the po Polish people who have moved for instance to Great Britain, which is another very interesting uh, situation for the near future. But this is another story and not the story of today. By the way, I regret 
that maybe at the end of my mandate I will be also in charge of the U uh, United Kingdom. Uh, but also this is another story. So we don't have uh, not only um, uh, east and southern neighborhood, but very soon western neighborhood. Uh, uh, so in, in a way, we are now surrounded by a real neighborhood. Uh, but once again, coming back to this um, economic perspective. So if there's such a big gap between us and the neighbors, this creates an immediate um, permanent threat. And one should not forget, uh, and I'm saying this deliberately here, uh, in Washington, far away from the regions we are talking today, but um, Europe is surrounded by 20, 22 million people uh, which are refugees, internal displaced people, uh, people which in a way are not there where they want to be. And they have the choice to go back, but this depends sometimes on the political situation, for instance Syria, or on the economic situation. And if it's on the economic situation in particular, they have the choice to go to Europe or they go back home. But they only would go home provided there are conditions which enable them a decent life. And therefore, uh, it's our goal, our aim, to support all these um, efforts, all these uh, developments, because it's in all our interest to have um, countries around Europe which are stable, which are closely connected to us, not only for political reasons, but once again for economic reasons and as it is in our daily private life, it's always good to have good neighborly relations, friendly relations. And this is our goal, our aim, and I think a, a well understandable um, interest of us. Having said all this, we have gradually developed our um, concept of Eastern Partnership. And this has led in 2017 um, at the Eastern Partnership Summit in Riga to the decision of um, um, to, to adopt a list of 20 deliverables um, for 2020, where we have, uh, so to say, identified areas where particular investments, particular activities on our side together with our partners are uh, necessary and are in a mutual interest. What are the four priorities? It's economy, uh, better governance, connectivity, and society. And as uh, Damon has already uh, pointed out, it's about many, many small, medium-sized, sometimes big projects, uh, which all together uh, produce a bustle, a, a, a picture, which finally leads to a much better relationship uh, with our neighbors and in particular improving uh, uh, the lives of uh, people in our neighborhood. And in that respect, we have started to implement this. And indeed, these 10 years allows us uh, to take stock about uh, the achievements and uh, have a very long list of what has been done. But I suppose this will be discussed, this will be addressed uh, during the further uh, panel discussions, but uh, only to, 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 to mention a few of them. For instance, because very often, I wouldn't say we are criticized, in the meantime, uh, people became silent because they have now already, if you like, discovered what is uh, behind of all these measures. There is, uh, what we are doing with these deliverables, what we achieve with these deliverables is highly politically. I mean, we are not, our aim is not, so to say, to provoke the neighbor of our neighbors. Uh, to be clear, who is not so fit in geography, it's about Russia. Uh, but uh, but uh, it's about creating, so to say, a belt of prosperity around Europe. And um, this means having, naturally, stronger ties uh, between us and our neighbors. And also here, of course, we have this 
common or joint concept of Eastern Partnership. It's about six countries, and all these six countries have very individual, very specific interests, means, and opportunities uh, how this cooperation with Europe uh, can take place. Three of them, for instance, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, have opted uh, to have the, the strongest possible relationship with us. Uh, we have an association agreement and deep and uh, uh, comprehensive free trade agreement. Uh, we have another um, agreement with Armenia. And we are, so to say, at the last mile, hopefully, to have an agreement with Azerbaijan. And even relationship with Belarus has advanced. But there are different levels, and this is uh, also the result of uh, the possibilities, opportunities, and uh, also um, um, wishes of our partners what should be the level of cooperation. But no matter what is the contractual arrangement, there are many, many opportunities uh, how we can very concrete support the, the different societies, the different uh, uh, business sectors, etc. And for instance, one of these achievements, and later on you will have the opportunity um, uh, to experience in a good way our Deputy General Director, Katarina Matanova, she is um, an expert on financing, and together with her team, she managed to create a product. I'm very proud that it was possible to have it, which means that we provide loans in Euro, and then they are able, don't ask me how, but they have done it to transfer uh, this EU loan into um, loans in local currency in order to offer these micro, small, and medium-sized companies. Because small companies are not used to work with uh, loans in foreign currency. I see Eugene, uh, he's famous, this finance minister, for very creative ideas. I think he's already thinking about something in, in that respect for, for Romania. But it's better to join sooner or later the euro than we have... Uh, <laughs> yes, it's dangerous to, to, to come forward with ideas uh, in, in presence of him, but for the others, please close your, close your ears. Uh, this was an extremely, uh, I think, important measure. In the meantime, I think we have supported more than 100,000 uh, small or medium-sized companies, and small or medium-sized companies in each uh, country are definitely the backbone of an economic uh, society. 90, 95% usually in a society, uh, or the jobs in a, in a society, in a country, are provided by small or medium-sized enterprises. So to do something for them is supporting the economic development, creating jobs. Uh, so I'm really proud about uh, these achievements. There are many other um, uh, initiatives we have done, for instance, uh, in the area of interconnection and energy efficiency. I mean, the waste, Ukraine, I, I think I can speak in the past, was uh, wasting 11 times more energy than it was, uh, than it is uh, wasted, uh, than the, the, the average waste in Europe. And if this, uh, so to say, waste of energy would be at the level of uh, the European Union countries, Ukraine, would not be forced to import any uh, oil and gas. And uh, I think we don't need a lot of, uh, so say, fantasy to understand what this means in political terms. So to, to uh, work on energy efficiency uh, is highly politically, but has also an immediate impact, because if you are able to insulate um, uh, uh, houses, uh, uh, thermic insulation. You create many, many jobs and uh, you help in particular deprive people if the energy bill is uh, lower than the month before. So it's a very um, complex issue, but in a positive way, um, highly um, effective and effective also in political terms. I'm not talking uh, too much, for instance, uh, about our intention to extend the trans-European network to our eastern partners. The aim is, by 2030, to extend fully-fledged the trans-European network, which we have already in the area of uh, 
highways, uh, railroads, more in general, and, and railways, but even uh, in waterways uh, to our uh, neighbors and to connect them much better, which uh, another, uh, so to say, strong contribution to more business opportunities. We have engaged very much in people-to-people -people activities. People-to-people -people activities enabling, in particular, young people, and in the meantime, more than 30,000 have used this opportunity to come to Europe, to study, to have internships, but also the other way around. It's about investing in the youth, in, in youth, in, uh, so to say, a network of friendship, of uh, positive relations, positive experiences, which, which stays for the rest of the life. And uh, we have many positive uh, examples. Uh, many of you probably here in the room have uh, experienced such uh, opportunities, and we should give this opportunity also to um, our friends and neighbors. Personally, I'm particularly proud that we could uh, open last September our first European school in Tbilisi, Georgia. This school is based on the idea of multilinguism. I mean, Europe is the continent of uh, multilinguism. So in this school, it's um, a high school, uh, people are taught in at least three languages. And then on top, voluntarily, they can even learn more languages. They will become familiar with European culture, European history, and they will have uh, finally uh, a baccalaureate, an international baccalaureate, which allows them to enroll uh, almost everywhere in the world. All this would not have been possible if we would not have uh, the opportunity to work closely together with our uh, international financial partners, some of them uh, like Alain from EBRD are here, uh, and also um, EIB and um, some others I have to, to, to add, uh, also national ones like uh, KFW, AFD, France, uh, uh, Germany, but also others, uh, if it's to the east, also uh, I think uh, Polish partners have been involved. And uh, they have uh, engaged with us uh, because uh, the Commission, European Commission I'm representing, usually uh, uh, provides grants. And then, of course, we, we used to leverage this. Uh, and for this, uh, we need uh, our partners. And I would like to use this opportunity also here in Washington to thank you for your extremely valuable competent uh, and engaged uh, cooperation. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been successful in many of these uh, areas I just have explained. Finally, once again, all this looks very technically, partly. Uh, it's, uh, so to say, a piece-by-piece -piece approach. But if you, if you keep the broader picture in mind, it's something where we have really managed to stabilize uh, these countries, to have more political continuity. We are very much in favor of uh, if changes, but only changes by vote and not by something else. And I mean, we are still far away from what I would consider a fully functioning uh, judiciary system. But we have made, or the countries have made steps into the right direction. And in that respect, if uh, you look how the situation was 10 years ago and uh, how it is today, I think we can really say uh, it's a success story. But uh, in order to be a success story also in 10 years, we have to do a lot. And we need support. We need also support here from the US uh, to, to pull at the same string to support us in these efforts. You know, and I think I could uh, describe, uh, we have a very precise idea what has to be done. By the way, we will start immediately after this uh, event with the preparation for the next deliverables for 2030. We now have, so to say, the avenue how to proceed. And I'm deeply convinced that at the end of the day, and nobody knows when exactly, but uh, in a couple of years, the living conditions for people in the regions are much better and this is finally in our interest. Thanks a lot for your interest. Thanks a lot, Damon, that uh, the Atlantic Council was ready uh, to organize this event together with us. And uh, I wish you 
a very fruitful discussion. I have to excuse myself, uh, apropos Atlantic. I have to cross the Atlantic uh, in order to be back in, in Brussels tomorrow morning. And therefore, I have unfortunately to leave in order to catch the plane. But thank you again for your interest and uh, again, fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Hahn, for your good words, your kind words, and for your leadership on this. It's now my pleasure to invite Minister Teodorovich to, to the stage and the capacity also of Romani leading Romania's uh, EU presidency. We're delighted to have you here in Washington. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will, uh, I will say a few words before starting my, my speech. I must deliver to you because this, was, this speech was prepared by, by officials. Uh, being now the president of the Council of Ministers, I have to provide something in this respect. I don't like this type of uh, discussion, but uh, I have to, to follow. So, but a few, few, few words, if I may, uh, because Han mentioned something about our uh, very good cooperation and I have to, to say that he was one of the best uh, commissioners we had in, uh, in the EU level. We, he support me as a Minister of EU Funds a lot when I try to, to bring a lot of money, EU money in, in Romania. We succeed, I succeed finally. But uh, I have to say also that uh, there are some issues to be, to be improved. Being uh, since 91 in the public administration, I have a very long list with this type of problems, uh, which must must be must be solved at the EU level. If we really love this EU family, and uh, if we really want to make things to to, to be ch to be changed, otherwise uh, the EU will face some problems in the next in the next future. This is my opinion, and uh, so there are some ideas. Maybe let's say I can give you one example. Um, Mr. Commissioner Han mentioned something about, uh, let's say, different ideas, maybe stupid ideas at the, at the, at the beginning, uh, put it by me on the table, but finally, uh, that stupid ideas was the one who really bring the big amount of money, in, at least into my country. And for sure, as a, for the EU as, as a whole. Um, I started to convince my, my colleagues in the, in the EU level because now we are discussing about the future financial framework 2021-2027. Uh, and I ask because you know that we are in a big competition, EU, EU US, China, okay? So I said, okay, for sure nobody in the US will uh, discuss this type of issues we are discussing at the EU level. These such stupid things and bureaucratic uh, uh, measures all the time we are trying to apply. Um, and I said, okay, why we have to, to wait to approve the budget for the next financial framework, which will start, as I said, in 2021, and to, to wait the 1st of June 2021 to start to spend the money for the investment projects, motorways and what we would like to, 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 to build in, in the EU. And we, don't, are not, we are not allowed as a member states to spend our own money from IFIs, from budget, doesn't matter from where, respecting the, the fiscal rules for sure. And then when the starting date is in place, for example, to bring the invoices, to send the invoices to Brussels and to reimburse the funds, we spend it for sure respecting all the rules. So this is the right way to, to put the money faster faster in the, in the economy and to, to increase our economy, as I said, being also in a big competition with the other uh, powers in the, in the world. But uh, the result, the, the, the reply was, how can we apply such a mechanism? Uh, and for sure, they will discuss after a few years uh, that this, about the fact that this idea was a very good one, but we were so stupid in the EU, not apply it. But we'll see. Uh, the second issue is the uh, we about discussed about the neighbors, you know, but only from the geographical point of view. You see, we are our neighbor. You know, it's very close. It's very close. It's sometimes it's very it's sometimes it's very close to uh, to us. Um, but the member states which are in the middle of the EU, they have even stronger relations 
with our neighbor than we are allowed to have. So, if we really want to apply the same rules for everybody, let's let's uh, let's uh, apply the same the same set of rules for everybody. Uh, otherwise, we are re we are the ones which are receiving advices from the bigger countries in the EU. We are not allowed to to open business um, or to make I don't know to have common projects with the neighbors, but all the others in or mainly or the main countries and mainly the, the others uh, they have very good relations and mainly economic relations. Uh, and uh, last issue, uh, Mr. Commissioner mentioned that um, you know that countries Moldavia, Ukraine, uh, and others they strongly. Uh, let's say f um, mention their their, their uh, will to to become uh, let's say part of the of the EU. You see, they underline their strong will, not the EU one, not the EU. You see, so the EU is waiting, it's selecting the future uh, members of the EU. If they have a very if they have an interest, they can start to discuss. If not. They can wait. So, in a way, this was the image of what is happening in the EU. Uh, we are li living in a very big family, but as I said, the members are uh, are living in, a, in a, or are treated in different in the different conditions. So, now I will start my official uh, my official speech, if I may. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, I, it gives me a great pleasure to extend to you all a very a warm welcome on behalf of the Romanian Presidency of the European Council and to say how grateful we are to the EU Commission and the Atlantic Council for hosting this important event here in uh, Washington DC. This year 2019 is, making, uh, is marking an important milestone in our relation with uh, the Eastern uh, Partners, 10 years since the launching um, of Eastern Partnership Initiative in, uh, in uh, 2009 May in Prague, as it was mentioned before. It is a symbolic, symbolic anniversary that demonstrates the maturity of a joint uh, and uh, over aimed at building a common area of shared democracy, prosperity, stability, and increased cooperation in line with the individual countries' aspirations. As presidency of the EU Council, Romania is working together with um, the European External Action Service, European Commission, member states, and our Eastern partners to properly mark this anniversary and to communicate the real benefits uh, that the Eastern Partnership provides for the citizens. The 10 um, years anniversary is not only an occasion for stock um, taking and celebration, but also for marking substantial progress towards the implementation of priority objectives for the year 2020, agreed at the Eastern, Eastern Partnership Summit in 2017. Sectorial cooperation is key area for joint efforts in implementing the priority agenda of the Eastern Partnership, one that brings to the fore uh, the tangible benefits for the, um, for the people. Romanian Presidency calendar of uh, events on Eastern Partnership included ministerial meetings aimed to mark concrete uh, deliverables and to respond to the real needs of the citizens, notably by promoting connectivity in priority areas, digital energy transport, and business. There's, there were some uh, some events uh, I don't have to mention to you because for sure you know it already. The Eastern Partnership Business Forum that we plan to organize in June in Bucharest is following as well established and welcome tradition. Increasing trade and investments have the capacity to produce tangible results and improve the economic um, well-being of the citizens. Those are core for EU's relations with our Eastern partners, countries, and again for our um, economies. It will also be an occasion to consider the opportunities extended for businesses through the implementation of the deep and comprehensive free trade agreements um, with Republic um, Old Moldavia, Ukraine, Georgia, and comprehensive and uh, enhanced partnership agreement with Armenia, as well as the possibilities of for new contractual agreements with Azerbaijan and Belarus. Uh, looking forward beyond our political engagements and current agenda 2020, more should be done, as also Mr. Commissioner uh, Han mentioned before, for responding to our partners' requests and needs, in particular with, the reg with regard to promoting sustainable economic and social development. One key way to achieve this is by strengthening the rule 
of law. Why I have this message in my in my speech? Rule of law. I never heard Commission discussing about rule of law in the last 15 years. I think even more. So about now they started to discuss. They put it in my speech. I have to say it, but I don't trust in it. Okay. Um, so I was n now I uh, I came on. It, it's just an idea to to be discussed also the, at the EU level. You see, the EIB, the European Bank for Investments, for example, where I'm uh, the governor uh, and also I'm the president of the governors uh, for one year. Uh, maybe the approach. Uh, for the bank must be changed in order to really support the economies in the in the, in the EU, for example. Now they are waiting the projects to come. No, first come, first served, more or less. Uh, but from my point of view, I think that we have to maybe to discuss, at least to discuss, uh, if we will succeed to change, it will be very good for all of us, or mostly for us, um, to have a pre-allocation approach. So if we have 65 more or less billion euro per year to be used, to be allocated, let's have this amount of money, 65 billion euro, to be pre-allocated based on, a, I don't know, the formula EU allocating the EU funds to the member states. Let's take an example. And then based on this approach, each member state will have a, a specific amount of money. EIB must go in that countries to discuss with the governments, identifying the projects, preparing the projects, finance the projects. This must be the mandate we as governors impose to, to EIB. In this way, will not be such situation as it is today. For example, Germany received in the last five years, I think, maybe I'm wrong, 32 billion billion euro in five years, more or less, but Romania received 2 billion euro. For sure, the, the, the first reply, it is, yes, but you don't have projects. Okay, I don't have projects, but maybe you can find together some projects because if our economy will receive not two, but five or seven billion euro, for sure our economy will, uh, will, will explode in the good sense. And having also this part of Europe uh, well developed, for sure, the social and economic cohesion, the main uh, subject we are discussing uh, about in the EU, will have chances to, to, be, to be reached. And future crises will not be so close. There will be, we don't know when, but for sure will not be soon if we apply such a, such a mechanism. But we will see. Um, yes, financing pr um, projects that promote prosperity and the increased regional integration is also a priority those contributing to the stability of the regions uh, and helping forging um, a stronger interregional inter partnership. In this process, sources of finance are essential. The EU should continue to support also in the upcoming financial framework in cooperation with um, IFIs, the socio-economic transformation of the region, focusing in particular on the development of transport and energy interconnections between the EU and Eastern Partnership countries, but also on digital economy as well as on small and medium enterprises. You see, small and medium enterprises, the price is different between the small and medium enterprises in, Rome, in, uh, in the EU. Being different costs of, uh, of uh, financing, how can we compete equally between us in the EU? Uh, for sure, the reply will be yes, but uh, the rating of, the, of your country or my country is uh, not so good than uh, the others. For sure, the rating is not the right one as it is today. This is my perception. Romania being uh, the country with the fourth uh, lowest uh, public debt in the EU. For sure, our deficit is very close to, to 3%, but we have also arguments. Anyway. It is a long list of, uh, let's say, um, issues to be discussed. Uh, Intra-EU mobility, uh, labor mobility, it's one of the main issues for countries as it is Romania. We are miss we're missing one million uh, uh, workers in, in our country. We have the money, we have the projects, but nobody is, able, is there to, 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 to implement the projects. So you see, stop, I saw there, stop, okay. Um, Thank you for your <laughs> message. You see, when I'm starting to be very open and honest and frank, this is what I'm receiving all the time. <laughs> Stop. OK. But being in America and US, I, I hope that this is the country where I can really open to, uh, to discuss openly and frank. But uh, it seems that even here it uh, becomes more and more difficult to, 
to discuss. And finally, I would like to close my speech by wishing uh, the Eastern Partnership every success. I hope that uh, every one of you will have fruitful and meaningful uh, exchanges of views on these important topics. Thank you, and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> Mr. Minister, thank you so much. We appreciate your frank remarks. You can take the podium. We're going to transition directly, and I'm going to hand over the microphone to Katharina Matanova, who is well known among our audience, uh, the D Deputy Director General, uh, who is a driving force on neighborhood policy and, and, and uh, enlargement negotiations. I'm going to hand over to you to introduce your panel and invite them to join you on stage. Thank you, Katharina. Thank you very much, uh, Damon. And uh, we have... Uh, Good news and bad news. The bad news is that not all the, uh, not all the participants are here. The good news is that after the exhaustive uh, presentations that we had, uh, we have a little bit of time left for the panel. So uh, with, fewer, with fewer people, we'll do better time management, uh, hopefully. Uh, so thank you very much for uh, coming on the panel. It's too bad the minister left because I was just going to say that it was a t an intriguing remark about. Okay, it was an intriguing remark to say that the European Commission doesn't talk about the rule of law, um, and he found it surprising in his speech because I think that's all what we talk about. We actually, and I actually think that it's a huge, huge innovation and actually result of the last few years, very much under the leadership of uh, Commissioner Hahn, that we started talking a lot more about economic development, economic fundamentals, business environment, investment climate, need for leverage, SME financing, etc. Because uh, until s relatively recently, there was a lot of talk only about the rule of law. And so I, it's, it's, it's interesting that uh, it, I'm pretty sure that was happening also when Romania was entering into the EU was, was the, the, the same rhetoric. But I think it's really important to make a connection between the two because having predictable legal environment and having enforcement of contracts, enforcement of, of, of deals, uh, uh, environment free of corruption is actually very important for economic development, for inward investment, for attracting uh, investors to parts of uh, geography that is not as, uh, as uh, well known to everybody. So I actually think there is a very, very strong link. And it's in fact uh, both this connection, but, but really the focus on economic development and business environment that we want to bring out in this panel. And this panel represents one of the four pillars. You see we have, we brought here with us this little logo, uh, this little propaganda sheet. And, uh, and the four uh, circles with the concentric circles are the four priorities under the uh, Riga agenda that are behind what the commissioner spoke about as 2020, uh, 20 deliverables for 2020. And the first uh, big one is, in fact, economic development uh, and uh, investment, trade, um, business uh, environment. And I think we have a very, very competent uh, panel with us to talk about it. And I will start with my immediate uh, uh, left uh, uh, with uh, Nico, Nico Gagua, who is an old friend, not as old, but a friend, uh, a former Minister of Finance of, uh, of uh, Georgia and uh, currently uh, Deputy Minister of Finance. And we just had a meeting this morning uh, together. Uh, next to him is uh, Marcy Tembon, who is the Regional Director for the South Caucasus in the Europe and Central Asia Vice Presidency of the World Bank. Also, uh, not old, but a friend. And uh, next to her is Alan Pilou, the oldest friend on the, on, the, on the panel. Definitely not the oldest, but the oldest friend. Uh, Vice President uh, of EBRD in London, in charge of business and policy operations. The whole of EBRD, essentially. Uh, and uh, had a long, distinguished career at EBRD. And the first time we met, he was a country director for my little country, among others, right? Uh, uh, Slovakia, when I worked uh, with, uh, with, uh, as an advisor to Deputy Prime Minister there. 
And instead of Deputy Minister of Finance of Armenia, who had uh, other engagements, so we are happy to have uh, the Armenian ambassador here, Mr. Varuzan uh, Nersesian. And uh, what we are going to do, we have about 50 minutes altogether. Uh, so I will ask for about five minutes uh, interventions uh, from you, but I'm going to actually pose questions, uh, Nico. Do we start with you? No. As the front runner mm -hmm. in yeah. the, in the uh, Eastern Partnership. So how is Georgia ensuring, what are you doing to fully benefit from the DCFTA? For those of you who have not heard what DCFTA means, it's a terrible acronym. It's a deep and comprehensive free trade area. It's the trade <coughs> part of the association agreement that we have entered into with uh, Georgia, Moldova, and Ukraine. So what is it that, uh, how are you taking advantage of it, and how can you do it better? Uh, we, we like that acronym very much. Uh, well, of course, uh, it's already 10 years since Eastern Partnership uh, Initiative was, was established. And looking back, I mean, it's quite incredible uh, to observe those achievements, as it said, uh, uh, that we had uh, during this period, and I think that when we when we talk about achievements, of course, association agreement is uh, and uh, deep and co deep and comprehensive free trade agreement is of course one of the one of the biggest achievements uh, for my country and uh, uh, for other countries. Uh, um, so I think that uh, uh, we these ten years were quite transformational. I, I would say. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, association agreement and the and uh, uh, DCFTA is not just a free trade agreement or um, some uh, political uh, agreement. So it is uh, uh, it's uh, one of the biggest driver of uh, economic reforms in Georgia and. And uh, if you look back, uh, so we, I think that we have achieved uh, quite significant uh, uh, achievements in economic reform and, uh, and um, uh, demonstrated by our progress in, in, in various uh, rankings where, for example, we are number six in doing business, we are number five in open budget index. So, and all those reforms uh, were, were uh, basically driven by our association agreement ag agenda and uh, and uh, so the transformation uh, the transformation uh, of the country uh, uh, which I represent I, I think that uh, we can see there and it, it's uh, it's it's quite tangible uh, the CFTA results can be also uh, uh, explained in uh, in figures uh, if, if we say uh, because um, uh, during the last 10 years, uh, 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 European Union is the uh, number one trade trading partner. If uh, back in 2009 um, it was just 17% uh, of uh, Georgian exports going to EU, now it's around 30%. I think it's quite, uh, quite incredible achievement, but, uh, and, uh, um, uh, yeah quite significant success but uh, when we talk about association agreement ab and about uh, the CFTA it's not uh, uh, it is not a story about past it's it's a story about future and uh, and we think that all this uh, uh, all those reforms as, as that we are uh, trying to implement will definitely find reflection in more uh, uh, in more qualitative results. Yeah, results are, are, are there. Results uh, without, with, without any dispute uh, are, are already there, but um, so uh, the future of, uh, of uh, association agreement and, uh, and the CFTA, I think that is something that we, we Georgians believe. We, we believe with patience and with reform or orientedness. And which would be the areas where you think you need to step up to really reap the benefits and increase the 30% 30, 30 is a great achievement, yes. but to actually increase it higher? Well, uh, basically, uh, so uh, I would mention two, two directions. First of all, it's very important uh, um, for, for the country, for the businesses to, fi to, to find 
for companies, uh, for Georgian companies to find uh, themselves more integrated in European, European value chains. And, uh, and then another uh, opportunity, which is, uh, I would say, untapped opportunities, I is that uh, it should be more SMEs uh, uh, active, uh, actively trading uh, with European Union. So at the moment, uh, I think that uh, if you analyze it, it's mainly big companies uh, that are uh, more easily accessing uh, European markets, but, but, but was what we see in the future is uh, more integration where uh, SME sector is, uh, is actually integrated in, in European value chains and uh, they, I mean, cooperate with U European counterparts much more easily and uh, much more efficiently. Thank you very much. And moving to Marcy, who has uh, who is in fact uh, close to the end of her mandate because she's been in the region since 2015. And uh, it would be uh, great to get a sense from you regionally, uh, how do you assess the social, economic, and geographic mobility within the region and look at the, at the, at the three countries and the progress they've made. Thank you very much, Katrina, for having me on this panel, and congratulations to the Eastern Partnership. Ten years is usually a very important milestone in the in the life of or in the history of anything, be it a human being or a country or a relationship. But I think this has been great. Um, I do cover Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, and these three countries um, are, are part of the South Caucasus. And they are countries that have a very, very strong aspiration to become middle um, class societies, just like other European countries. And they, have, they are really on track um, to achieve this reality. After a, a difficult transition um, from when they all became independent in 1992, um, they've, they've had to go through very uh, serious economic reforms um, that have actually paid off in welfare indicators. Um, poverty was about 50, 60 percent before they became independent, but they are all now in their 20s and below 20s. So they've really made uh, tremendous um, progress in having, um, in actually improving the well being of people. However, in terms of mobility, be it economic, social, or spatial, it's not been homogeneous. Um, our assessment is that they've made a lot of progress, um, but many households still remain vulnerable to falling back into poverty. Um, and so um, that our poverty team in the, in the bank um, set out to actually find out how we can actually, how we, what, what is the cause of all of this and what we can do about it. And basically they wanted to find out you know, um, why the economic gains have not been equitably um, translated um, in if to welfare for, for everybody. They also wanted to know the geographical areas um, that have been um, affected either negatively or positively. And I'm happy to report that um, document has just been produced, which will be released in the commission in, in um, the next month in, in, in Brussels. It's called South Caucasus in Motion. So if you can check it out, download it, you, you'd find that. And what this um, document is saying is looking at mobility from the economic aspect, um, which can be defined as how mobile are the people within one generation, from childhood to adulthood. And it also looks at social mobility between generations, you know, from parents to child. So if the father or the parents were poor, what's going to become of their children? So, you know, that intergenerational uh, uh, poverty. And it looked at it also from a spatial perspective from different parts of the country, more, uh, be it rural, urban, you know, city, village, and things like that. And the, the, f the findings were actually telling. The first finding was that Escaping poverty is not a one-way route. You can always come back. Because we found out that prior to the, um, prior to the uh, financial crisis, the global financial crisis in 2008, 
um, people had actually, the, the, the progress that the countries had made in, in economic growth had actually benefited most of the, of, the, of the population because they had social protection systems, they had, you know, there were many, many um, ways in which the governments actually got people out of poverty. But as soon as the co economic crisis hit, they fell back into poverty. About 60% of the people who were, who were poor in 2016 were not poor in 2010. So they had benefited from the, the, the global financial crisis, but then they fell back into pro poverty after that. The second finding was that um, the sizable number of people, uh, the proportion of the population that is still very much at risk, those in the rural areas, rural and mountainous areas, they kind of don't benefit from the, the, the fruits of, of growth. They don't have access to basic social facility, uh, services. They don't have access to, to, to opportunities for jobs. They don't have, so they are really the ones that are still remain, they still remain poor. So social mobility there, it's very, very difficult for them. And the other one, the, the third finding is that the youth of today are very, very um, prone to not being guaranteed um, middle class status. Why? Because they're jobless. You have many graduates, people who they've completed school, they've done different courses and so on, but they still don't have jobs. So they're still relying on their parents. They're still at home. And so mobility in terms of um, well-being is very much um, not in their favor. And finally, um, being again in a, in a rural environment, the geographical um, characteristics actually cause some people not to move socially. So poverty just gets, you know, mobility from one generation to the other is very difficult. Mobility even from child in within a ge generation is very difficult. And these findings do actually um, call on us to make sure that we kind of ensure that these countries have sustainable economic development that will enable them stop this falling back, this vulnerability into poverty. Very interesting. Thank you very much. And a uh, good lesson to, to uh, follow. Now let's look at the, uh, from the private sector angle mm -hmm. and take advantage from, uh, of Alan's experience and deep knowledge of the 36 countries that EBRD follows. 38. 38, OK. So 38 countries by, by now. And if you can look at, at the whole region, I mean, it's in fact two sub-regions, but all of the Eastern uh, Partnership countries, what are your, in your experience and, and, and view, the sources of growth for these countries and the constraints uh, that uh, you see? Right. Well, first of all, a big thank you to uh, the Atlantic Council, uh, Damon, I think, huh? and uh, and to the European Union, to you, Katarina, for uh, organizing this and, uh, and inviting me. Uh, first of all, I have a question. We are honored by the presence of people from the military in this room. I want to know where you are from. <laughs> Norway. 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 Wow. <laughs> and uh, military school or? Uh, or Okay, excellent. Well, you are most, we are honored by your presence. And one of you was sleeping, so my intention <laughs> is, <laughs> I, I, I spotted him, so my intention is to wake you up, guys, you know, so. So, um, voila. Re returning to Katarina's question. Uh, uh, now, uh, uh, first of all, you know, uh, when I was much uh, younger, unfortunately, I was in uh, charge of a business in Russia at EBRD. And at the beginning, I was a bit lost. Uh, it's a big country and a very complex one. But I had a very close friend who is still a very close friend. And maybe you have, you have heard of him. His name is Leszek Balcerowicz. And he was the architect of the reform program in Poland, which was called the shock therapy at some point. And uh, when I was in Russia, he was the president of the Central Bank of, uh, of, of Poland. And uh, I went to see him and I said, well, Leszek, what can I tell the, the Russians, you know, uh, what they should do to achieve prosperity? So I needed a bit of advice. I was a bit lost. And he, he smiled, I remember, and he told me, you know, Alain, you should 
just tell them to read the right books. And uh, what, he meant, what he meant by that, of course, was uh, a bit uh, deeper than that. What he meant is that in the economic field, it is uh, very dangerous not to ride on the trodden paths. You know? It's very good to apply the standards of good management of an economy because the worst uh, which can be done is instability and unpredictability in economic policies. And I will not give you examples, but you can read every day in the papers examples where this uh, leads to uh, suboptimal results. Now, getting into the, uh, into the, the substance of uh, Katarina's question, we believe at EBRD for a long time we have expressed our thinking you know in a very uh, jargonesque fashion so we thought maybe let's uh, find words which everybody can uh, understand and we tend to believe that a, a market economy and it is the case of the six economies of the eastern partnership works well grows creates jobs when it has six qualities which are easy to uh, uh, express and to understand. First of all, <coughs> it has to be competitive. Second, it has to be well governed. Third, it has to be green. Fourth, it has, it has to be resilient, and this has to do with the financial sector, with capital markets. Fifth, it has to be integrated. This has to do with connectivity. It will be the subject of the second seminar. Infrastructure, energy, digital, information systems. And it has to be inclusive. In other terms, for example, a society which does not make good use of its women and its young is not in a good shape. And there are many who are not making good use of women and, and the young and disabled people and, and, and other uh, categories. Uh, when we ourselves uh, prepare our strategies per country to see where we are going to do business, where we are going to engage with the government, we try to benchmark the countries mm, with respect to these six qualities, see where they are compared to the best practice, compared to Norway, for example. Uh, it's, a, it's a good, good, good benchmark. And uh, uh, more recently, together with the European Union, and thanks to Katarina, we worked also on documents which are very interesting, which we call investment climate action plans, which have been done, completed for each of the six Eastern Partnership countries and are a basis for action to be implemented, by the way, by a broad array of institutions, not only by the European Union and by us, but by the EIB, the World Bank, and, and first of all, the countries themselves. Now, you ask me a question, so I will try to, to answer. I cannot focus on everything because uh, we could, uh, of course, write a book uh, about your, your question, but let me focus on two elements, which in my professional life have come to be uh, maybe the most important of these qualities and apply very well to the six Eastern Partnership countries. The first element is governance. Governance, good governance is absolutely key to economic development, to growth, to job Let creation. Let us call the minister back. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. So this is true. I will not go into the nitty gritty and Anders Astun is here, so I'm sure he will agree with me. It has to be true at the national level. It means that you need to have functioning anti-corruption institutions. And it is not always the case. In Ukraine, for example, there is a lot more to do in order to achieve a good level of fight against uh, corruption. The public administration has to be competent and efficient. And the EU, Katarina, are working a lot on that in order to improve uh, things. The judiciary has to be efficient. If you want to invest in a country, you need to know that if you get into trouble, the courts can enforce your rights. Otherwise, you don't invest. You will invest elsewhere, where you believe that the courts will enforce your rights if you get into, into trouble. It, what is true at national level, it has to be true also at regional and municipal level, because it is the level where the people's lives are changed often. You, by district heating, by buses, trams, uh, uh, water, uh, wastewater, solid waste management. This has to be managed. And to be managed, 
municipalities need good governance, and we do a lot of that at EBRD, but not only us, uh, the EIB, the World Bank is doing a lot of that. And it has to be true at enterprise level. And enterprise level, it means both the state-owned companies and state-owned banks, where often there are problems of governance, but also in the private sector. It is not because a company is private, or in, just in the private sector, because private means something else in American, it is not the re you know, a, 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 an absolute assurance that it will be well governed. Right? It's more complicated than that. This is why, with our partners, we focus on an ombudsman in Ukraine in order to get together enterprises and the government. This is why we focus in Moldova with Kristina, who is your deputy uh, uh, central bank governor of, of Moldova, on uh, getting the banking sector well governed with new shareholders and we got out together and the uh, older shareholders who are not that good uh, you will you will admit that and we the, the work is not completely finished yet this is why we focus on municipalities everywhere this is why we focus on foreign investors councils everywhere in order to put together the private sector and the government so this is the first point the second point i want to focus on is competitiveness because if you remember these qualities i told you at the beginning Competitiveness, in a way, is the unifying factor. It is in order to make the economy more competitive that you get it greener, more resilient, more integrated, more inclusive, etc. How do you make an economy more competitive? First of all, it has to do with people. The problem that all these guys in the six Eastern Partnership countries have in common is that people are going. The young are emigrating a lot. And this is a very, very difficult problem to manage. In Moldova, I think the average age of the population, Christina, must be 43, 44 years now, like in Serbia, huh? more, more or less. This could become a tragedy. Uh, you cannot continue like this. You need to, to uh, retain the young at home. And to retain them at home, you need to be able, first of all, to offer them a good education so that they can get skills and then you need to have an economy which can create jobs otherwise they will go abroad in order to find the job and in order to find a better climate so labor is absolutely crucial second you need money you need capital this is economic theory maybe you recognize it but uh, i try to put it in a in a way which uh, which uh, 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 everybody you know uh, can feel close to capital in order to get capital in an economy, first of all, you need a functioning banking sector. It is the fashion of the day, as you know, for now 10 years to criticize the banks. However, you know, in order to progress, either if you want a house or if you want to build a company, you need banks. So you need a well-functioning banking sector and you need also well-functioning capital markets because the banks are only one aspect of the financing of an economy. You need to have also a state which is able to implement infrastructure and energy projects. You feel it is, it goes without saying, because in uh, Norway, you know, there is no problem, but there are a lot of problems, in particular in the countries where we are, which we are talking about, and also in EU countries. A minister has left the room, but I can tell you that in his country there are a lot of problems to implement infrastructure projects. I should, uh, it's a pity that he's not here because I could have reminded that to him. Um, uh, and this means that sometimes you have underinvestment. Huh? Actually, in a certain country, I will not tell you which one, but there are so few motorways that a guy has decided, in a sign of protest, to build one meter of motorway in front of his house. Uh, so uh, if you Google it up, you will see which country. Um, uh, because it must be on, uh, on YouTube. Uh, so you need to have so a good project implementation capacity. This takes a long time to develop, a very long time. You cannot do that and the next day things are brilliant. It's a long-term effort in which you know, the European Union uh, in particular is, is absolutely uh, crucial in the Eastern Partnership. And the third element is innovation. When you put the three together, labor, capital, and innovation, it's called the solo theory in economics. Voilà. So it's, uh, but, um, but there is no need to mention it. Uh, it's just common sense. Innovation is very important in the countries we are talking about because there is a reservoir of talent in those countries. When you look at it in detail, there are quite a number of young people who have ideas, who create uh, tech companies, 
And it is, of course, the reason why they need uh, to, be, to, to, to stay at home. Uh, do you have Viber in your iPhones? Viber, where was it created? In Belarus. But then it did not stay in Belarus. It was sold to Rakuten, a Japanese company. So it was created in Belarus, but Belarus could not keep it. You see, but Belarus created it. Uh, Skype, it was in Estonia that it was created. In Bulgaria, there is a hotbed of technology. Armenia, a lot of things are happening. Uh, and in all, in all countries, we are talking about Ukraine and Moldova, everywhere. But if the young stay, otherwise they will create their company in the Silicon Valley, or in Germany, or in, or in the UK. Uh, so uh, uh, they can benefit their economy if they stay at home. Um, we have talked about SMEs already, so I will not, uh, I will not mention it. Uh, just a word on inclusion. It's a factor of competitiveness. Uh, women, the young, it's very, very important. It's not political correctness. It's just an economic fact. Uh, so this is very important to have in mind. Last point, because I've talked already uh, too much. What is important for us, the international institutions, uh, for Vasil, or for myself, or Katarina, it is, of course, to do tangible things and to invest, uh, to advise the governments properly. People like Anders are doing that all the time in a fantastic way for, 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 uh, for, for a long time. It is also extremely important to speak up when we see things which should not happen. And I will not go into the nitty gritty, but a number of things in the countries where uh, um, we are talking about today have happened in the last few months, which I don't like. So we say that uh, to the governments and uh, sometimes they listen, sometimes they don't. But it's extremely important when you have friends to, in a way, have a blunt conversation. Uh, we say in my language, qui aime bien, châtie bien, which means when you love somebody, you castigate them well you know, at the same time. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is what has to be done in order to make progress everywhere. It's not you know, political correctness. It goes nowhere. It's just blunt and tough conversations. This gets you somewhere. Thank you, Katharina. Merci, Alain. Uh, I was observing the crowd closely, and nobody was sleeping. So I think you achieved Good. your. Good. At least I've achieved something. Good. And uh, and uh, <laughs> this is my experience as well. That uh, as the best friends of these regions, one does need to be blunt. This is not the region that deals in nuances, and and so I think that uh, I think that's very much uh, uh, well meant and well understood uh, message. I just want to tell you, we are going to have uh, the last uh, words now from uh, the Armenian ambassador. And after that, there will be chance for, there will be chance to ask uh, uh, questions. So think about your questions. And I will now ask the ambassador, uh, you had momentous changes in your country uh, last year that we all watched uh, with uh, excitement. And Post, post the Velvet Revolution that uh, you, you called it, um, what, what are the sources, what are the plans for higher growth and, and economic development uh, for Armenia? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Madam Moderator. And as you just said in the beginning, <coughs> I was not supposed to appear today here at this discussion, but I'm happy to be here because uh, Deputy Finance Minister was participating in a parallel discussion at the World Bank discussions. So I'm happy to be here and I want to also greet the Norwegian Military Academy people uh, to say that <coughs> uh, in response to your question that of course last year's uh, revolution, what is now known in world politics as Armenian Velvet Revolution or Armenian Revolution of Love and Tolerance ushered in a new era into my country and brought in, since our independence, brought in a completely new reality to Armenia. Um, Armenia has undergone an uh, enormous transformation since its independence, has experienced a lot of transition uh, period difficulties. But what happened last year, exactly one year before uh, this, uh, it was in a way unprecedented. Uh, why it was unprecedented because for the first time the people of Armenia felt themselves fully in control of the political power. Um, not to say that before this Armenia was not a democracy. Armenia was a democracy. But the, the Velvet Revolution 
brought a completely new dimension into Armenian uh, democracy. And it, uh, if in the past we had elections, there were some irregularities, there were some wrongdoings, uh, but last December's elections, which took place after the uh, Velvet Revolution, was recognized as uh, completely free and fair and meeting uh, all the international standards. So in this sense, it was also unprecedented that these were c the cleanest elections that we had since our independence. But the revolution itself, it was an uh, unexpected um, <coughs> expulsion, an unexpected expression of the people's uh, will, uh, which started as a, um, a march of the incumbent prime minister of Armenia, who was at the time an opposition leader, a march of 13 people all the way from the northern uh, town of Armenia, second town of Armenia called Gyumri. Uh, and by the time they arrived in the capital Yerevan, it was an uprising of hundreds of thousands in the streets. But one of the important features was that it was completely peaceful. Although the police and the people were facing each other in the streets, no single instance of casualties of violence was reported, no single uh, instance of clash uh, was reported apart from minor things that happen anytime, anyway. But <coughs> this was the basic characteristics that this took place, you know, a revolution of dance, of kids in the streets with their toys and with their parents holding their hands each other, uh, blocking the streets peacefully. So this was a, a, a very peaceful revolution in Armenia that, that uh, brought in new reality. But when the prime minister came to power, he initiated very strong reforms. First of all, the fight against corruption. The prime minister, as he pledged you know, before, uh, in front of the people to eradicate, to uproot the corruption in Armenia, he undertook a very serious campaign. The law enforcement agencies uh, initiated a number of operations to return the previously stolen assets to, to the state budget and to undertake also institutional measures uh, to er eradicate corruption. Also, the independence of judiciary became a top priority uh, for the government. And the prime minister openly and publicly, publicly de declared that uh, from now on, when he came to the power, that there is no longer going to be a case when a government official or executive can call the judiciary and try to influence the decision making by the judiciary. And this is also speaking about the economy, one of the main prerequisites of success of the business to have independence of judiciary. And now Armenia is very much advancing in this uh, sense as well. Also eradication of monopolies in the case, uh, because in the past there were instances that there were uh, some fields of economy that were monopolized by certain people or oligarchs. So this was also uh, eradicated in Armenia in, uh, in this short period of time prior to the elections. And after the elections, new government was elected and, and uh, <coughs> with a new energy entered into, uh, uh, into the new period of the government. And uh, in the government program of this new government, uh, um, the, the main next priority is the economic revolution. So what the prime minister is saying is once the political revolution took place and there is a full-fledged democracy now in Armenia, that the corruption is being eradicated and in other institutions of good governance are being uh, now uh, uh, entering into, into the full action, now it's the time for economic revolution. Armenia is not a country with full economic resources. And Armenia is a country uh, with four borders only, out of which four, uh, out of four neighbors, uh, four borders, two are closed, are blockaded due to certain geopolitical uh, reasons, which I don't want to elaborate right now on. And it has two open borders. One is Georgia, and about around 70% of uh, uh, trade turnovers takes place uh, through Georgian territory, a friendly country with us, with whom we share millennia of friendly history and relations between Armenian and Georgian people. And the southern border uh, goes via Iran. And two other borders, as I mentioned, it's, uh, they're closed at this point. Um, so <coughs> for the economy, uh, uh, in this environment, there are several areas that the government works hard to uh, bring the development of the country into a new mode. 
Uh, first of all, uh, the spheres of uh, high tech is a top priority for the government, IT and high tech, and Armenia has a strong uh, capacity in this sphere. These days, there are many companies from Silicon Valley investing in Armenia, and uh, Armenia also develops strong foundations for IT education. For instance, we have a, a center called TUMO, which is now being even exported to cities like Paris, to Moscow, to uh, Beirut, which is a IT education model uh, for free. Uh, it provides free IT education and programming education for kids. And then later a a age, they, they enter uh, IT companies and IT companies uh, hire them. Uh, uh, so uh, biotech and pharmaceuticals is also along with high tech and IT yet another priority of the government because being a country under the blockade and deprived of major natural resources, you have to develop such fields which uh, do not depend on the transportation route. So IT and uh, biotech and pharmaceuticals are one of those spheres that provide us with an opportunity to develop without depending necessarily on the roads and communications. Another field <coughs> of uh, economy, of course, is agriculture, which provides about 12% of our uh, economy. And Armenia has uh, strong potential also in uh, IT sphere. I, I see that now it's time for Q&A. Just to say that also another, along with uh, agriculture, uh, tourism is yet another sphere, which is a great perspective to develop in Armenia because Armenia has strong foundations uh, in uh, ecotourism and also in cultural tourism. So these are the priorities of the government and economic revolution is going to take place in these uh, perhaps areas, but the most importantly providing opportunities for businesses and for the citizens that the new government has pledged and is trying to make sure. And apart from that, of course, the Eastern Partnership is a top priority for us. Uh, but I, I understand we don't have much time to elaborate on that, so thank you very much. Well, I think we all wish uh, Armenia good luck in uh, implementing the, the ambitious, uh, ambitious plans. So we had, Anders and I had to agree on how to shorten, how to shorten the, the time uh, of the panels uh, in light of the length of the uh, presentation. But uh, we have about 10 minutes, so I will take what, two, three questions and then, and then uh, uh, please introduce yourselves and also say whom are you addressing the question to. Yes. My name is Walter Jurassic, I'm a member in Polish-American Congress. Um, do you think that Brussels became too bureaucratic in sense of management, all the European Union, and I'd like to hear about more, what do you do with the reform on taxation in all of those countries which you just belong to them? Because how you can address the taxation? Okay, so one question was whether Brussels has become too bureaucratic, and uh, the yes. second was uh, on uh, taxation. That's, we have two questions there, please. Thank you. Uh, Alexey Alexishvili from Georgia. My question to Marcy, um, so is there any sector or uh, area for, as a priority for World Bank as a, for, for the next five or ten years in the region, uh, maybe not common to all the countries, but uh, separate to each of these countries? Thank you. Thank you, and let's take one more. Okay. If not, uh, who wants to take the tax question? And the Brussels bureaucracy question. Well, on the <laughs> <laughs> on the on the tax question, it's not a specialty of EBRD. We we invest, and in particular in the private sector, but also in in the public sector from time to time. Uh, the IMF are, are the specialists uh, of that, and the uh, and and the World Bank. Uh, just one one comment, uh, because because countries. Uh, uh, try to uh, attract investment from abroad. There has been a tendency uh, in many of the countries where we operate to lower the tax rates on many uh, ma many uh, kinds of taxes. Uh, it is often quite good in economic terms, but it is also sometimes dangerous 
because if you reduce excessively the tax base in order to attract, well, first of all, everybody is equal at a very low rate. And secondly, you uh, may get into trouble in order to finance you know, the needed infrastructure in the, in the country. So it is a dilemma. Uh, and uh, there, there is a balance somewhere which is different from country to country. Voilà, that's all I want to say on taxation. Um, Marcy, on the uh, priorities of the bank? Right. Uh, uh, just probably to add on, yes. the, on the taxation uh, one as well, and to inform the um, person who asked the question, that uh, within the, the, our support to the respective countries, we support them to, to, to implement reforms, um, and reforms on taxation, and how to make their taxation systems efficient and progressive so that they can be able to collect necessary taxes that will be able to fund the investment programs that they need to do. We successfully did that in Armenia. We've successfully done that in Georgia. And, and, and I think we've been getting some fruits from there. Taking into consideration that there are some people who would be in a different tax bracket and so on, but having a tax system that is efficient and, and, and effective is extremely important, and we do support that. In terms, so to the question about the, the, the vision for the South Caucasus, we um, have, we actually elaborate our, our programs within something called a country partnership framework. And that framework is done after a systematic country diagnostic, which we do systematically in all three countries. We just had the country partnership framework uh, for Georgia endorsed by the board uh, in April last year, and that has three pillars. It goes along the lines of what the Vice President Wei just said. The first pillar is about growth and competitiveness. The second pillar is about human capital, because you, know, you need fiscal capital, but you actually need human capital, which is really the base. And the third pillar is, um, is on resilience. And this resilience is not just economic resilience, but it's economic, environmental, and social. Um, resilience. So that's that's the uh, the plan that we have for Georgia. There are so many activities that we have within that, and for the competitiveness um, pillar, also we need com uh, uh, connectivity because these are small countries. They need to be connected to the bigger, to the global market, and being part of the Eastern Partnership of the EU opens up the market for them to be able to improve their exports. For um, for Armenia, we just had the 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 the, the partnership framework approved um, endorsed um, two days ago. In fact, on the 28th of March. And this one, the first pillar on that one is boosting exports. It's a small country, yes, but how do you boost exports in those countries? And Armenia is doing fantastic things in the IT industry. If you really haven't visited, you need really need to go see what they're doing there. Human capital is a middle pillar also because we still need to have a lot of work to do in providing the young people with the necessary skills that will get them into jobs. Not necessarily public sector jobs, but being able to create the jobs themselves. But then you need a conducive environment for that. And of course, the, um, the, 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 the topography and the, again, resilience is a, is a big thing. Last point for me, uh, Azerbaijan is diversifying the economy. The economy is highly driven by oil, and we need to get it look, get having an economy that's driven by other things other than oil. That's where what we plan to do. Thank you very much. And just to keep with the with the time, let me abuse my my privilege of a moderator uh, to the question on Brussels bureaucracy. Um, I think it's a much more complex question than just ad-libbing in one or two sentences. The, the only thing I will say is that uh, 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 the view of Brussels in, uh, in, uh, in national capitals and cities is very thwarted and, and often misinformed and what is ascribed to Brussels are actually decisions taken by, by member states who are the decision makers in the, in the European Union. So, but that's for a longer, that's for a longer uh, discussion, so I wouldn't want to, to uh, bore the audience. But uh, uh, going back to uh, some of the points, both of you, all, all three of you, in fact, talked about uh, uh, human capital and, and, and governance, but you all stressed the need also for access to finance and, and uh, capital for 
pump-starting the, the economy. And the one, I want to mention two initiatives that we, in fact, have uh, started. Alain mentioned that under something called Structural Reform Facility, we actually asked the EBRD to, to do an overview of the investment climate gaps uh, across the Eastern Partnership countries and identify priorities that uh, uh, our partner institutions will work with our partner countries on, uh, on uh, improving. But the other element that we have done where the World Bank's helping is to look at um, diversifying the financial sector beyond banks. Alan, you correctly said that we need banks, but uh, Europe in general and Eastern uh, partnership countries in particular are very heavily overbanked and there are very few opportunities to get non-bank finance, whether it's releasing, factoring, collateral lending, inventory financing, etc. So the bank is in fact uh, helping us and Georgia is the, Georgia is the, the pilot uh, country in a sense looking at access to finance beyond the banking sector. And I don't mean uh, uh, capital markets because that's not really, the economies are not going to support that in any massive way. But the smaller ways of, especially for SMEs, uh, getting beyond uh, access to bank finance. And the second initiative I want to mention is uh, we are launching, we have launched uh, two years ago, and now we are in fact negotiating the, the, the actual contracts with our partner institutions, something called uh, external investment plan, where we um, in fact offer guarantees uh, via EIB, EBRD, IFC, uh, KFW, IFD, et cetera, to uh, our partner countries to attract, to crowd in private sector into uh, development and whether it's for SME support, whether it's for energy efficiency, whether it's for cities, uh, agriculture, a number of uh, areas uh, that um, will hopefully uh, be an important contribution to the economic development of, uh, of the Eastern Partnership. So it's sort of all coalescing around the 10th anniversary and uh, with this, I'm actually giving up on my closing remarks because we are running out of time. And uh, so I'm just going to say happy birthday, Eastern Partnership. And uh, thank you for the panelists. And we are turning over to Anders for the second panel.
uh, I think. Uh, <laughs> Welcome back everybody. My name is Anders Åsland. I'm a senior fellow here at uh, uh, the Atlantic Council and I've been dealing with uh, East European uh, economies for uh, a few decades. <laughs> and uh, written a number of books about uh, the, the region as a whole, the, uh, in particular about Russia and, and uh, Ukraine. And it's a great pleasure uh, to me to have a uh, wonderful uh, panel here with essentially all finance uh, officials. So uh, what I would like to do here today is to try to utilize this resource in front of you in the hopefully as uh, efficient fashion as uh, uh, possible. What we are discussing now, uh, as Damon Wilson discussed in the beginning, it is 10 years of the uh, Eastern Partnership. What uh, has it uh, brought? How should it uh, be further developed so that it can be as uh, efficient as, um, as uh, possible? And in this uh, panel, we have uh, two country representatives and two uh, representatives of very important international financial uh, institutions. So I thought that I should uh, uh, start uh, turning to the two country representatives and then uh, uh, ask uh, the international financial institutions what they see that they can do about these uh, questions. And while the first uh, session was um, dealing with the economy more generally, we are now supposed to move on to energy and connectivity. Connectivity meaning transportation and, um, and co uh, uh, co communications. Uh, and in the area of energy, there are many problems. So this is a wonderful to topic that we discuss very often here at the Atlantic uh, Council. One uh, topic, our favorite topic, that is what to do with Gazprom. How should one manage Gazprom? That's what we like most of all. And in this time, I don't think that we'll discuss Nord Stream 2. I think that train, unfortunately, has gone. But um, we, uh, how should uh, Gazprom be uh, managed? Uh, as um, Commissioner Hahn mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, <coughs> energy usage is all along too inefficient. There have been great improvements in this area, but uh, more can be done. Here all uh, uh, plays uh, matters. And of course production can be uh, increased uh, in the, uh, the region. And then we have uh, the question of uh, governance and uh, corporate uh, governance in state, uh, state companies. I should uh, say that uh, as a matter of disclosure, I'm actually a, a member of the uh, uh, supervisory board of the Ukrainian State Railroads, a mining company with 264,000 employees. So uh, I'm uh, deeply involved in this topic, but that is uh, uh, not, uh, uh, not energy. So I would like to turn uh, f uh, first uh, to uh, Deputy uh, <coughs> Minister of uh, Finance, Yuri uh, uh, Halite, who has worked for many years uh, first in the National Bank and then in, uh, in the Ministry of Finance, who is a true finance uh, uh, a specialist. What uh, can be done? You have done a lot about uh, state uh, uh, companies and how to improve uh, uh, corporate governance in the, uh, the, the state uh, institutions. Right now, you have uh, three big state banks that you're trying to uh, uh, sort out and set up uh, uh, corporate uh, governance in that. How do you go about it? You've already done it in Naftagas, the most important uh, uh, company in Ukraine. What are you going to do next? Uh, thank you for warm uh, remarks. 
uh, it's a uh, pleasure to participate in this night event. It's a great opportunity to discuss important issues uh, regarding energy sector, regarding uh, corporate governance. In Ministry of Finance, uh, one of uh, top goals nowadays is reforming of corporate governance. Uh, we are responsible for state-owned banks, and uh, for the last uh, three uh, months, we are actively ha have been implementing the uh, change of corporate governance structure in state-owned banks. We are going um, by the mid of May have uh, to have three uh, independent supervisory boards uh, in uh, Oshad Bank, Exim Bank and Privat Bank. It's important to mention that state-owned banks uh, participation in the banking sector of Ukraine exceeds 50 percent and our priority is to reform these banks, especially in the area of corporate governance. We have already uh, very active and effective uh, supervisory boards in the uh, two state-owned banks and comparing with old-fashioned uh, corporate governance structures, it's really our top priority to, to have uh, uh, international experts like we have in Ukrazaliznitsa, in uh, NAFTA uh, uh, to have in the, the mentioned banks. We uh, cooperate closely with uh, IFIs in this area. Uh, we have already established nomination committee with advisory uh, vote participation of from uh, IMF, World Bank, EBRD, and IFC. Uh, we have already hired three uh, international HR companies which will be responsible for uh, submitting us short list of uh, the candidates. Uh, our view is that only independent supervisory boards with international, uh, international experts in these boards can help to change uh, business models to, uh, to make these business models more effective, to change operational models of the banks as well to improve practices and effectiveness of the risk management uh, framework. Another top priority for us uh, uh, is energy efficiency issue, is uh, reducing of energy intensity of our, uh, of our economy. Speaking about energy efficiency, first of all, we have to focus on uh, competitiveness of the economy. Unfortunately, uh, nowadays Ukraine is among top 30 uh, largest energy consumers, uh, but uh, ranked number 60 in the world uh, in terms of the nominal GDP. Uh, this means that for one US dollar of our production, our energy costs are three times higher than in Poland uh, and four times higher than in, for example, in uh, Turkey. And we have to uh, proceed with uh, practical implement implementation of uh, reforms in this area and our priority is to shift the state's focus from subsidizing inefficient energy uh, consumption to stimulate uh, the country's energy modernization. In this regard, it's as well crucially important for us uh, backing the support from uh, IFIs. We cooperate closely with European Investment Bank, with EBRD. Recently, uh, we uh, started uh, Energy Efficiency Fund uh, we created uh, corporate governance structures and I hope this is will help us as well to modernize our energy sector. Uh, it's like a short uh, introduction and I hope during uh, this panel we will discuss all this in more details. Thank mm. you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would li then like to turn to uh, Christina uh, uh, Hara. You are Deputy Governor of uh, the National Bank of Moldova for now uh, soon three years and uh, before that you worked uh, as an investment uh, manager uh, in particular in Horizon Capital which is a regional investment uh, uh, company and uh, I have two questions uh, to you Christina one question is uh, uh, Moldova has had big problems with uh, in particular gas supply you are now trying to solve it uh, by uh, getting a pipeline from Romania and uh, using all kinds of other uh, means. And uh, uh, you, uh, you, uh, you have managed, thanks to the uh, uh, association agreement and the deep uh, comprehensive uh, free trade agreement with the European Union, you have now more than two-thirds of your exports going uh, to the European Union. How does this hang together, your trade connectivity and uh, your problems uh, with gas supply? Thank you very much. Uh, actually, your question has, uh, 
half of the answer. And, uh, <laughs> you know, for me, of course, as a banker and a central bank, it would be much more easier to talk to you about the full turnaround of the banking sector that we have done uh, in the aftermath of the crisis and of uh, the fraud that made our country unfamous. But there are other critical issues that the country needs for further development. There are some basic issues that need to be addressed and need to be solved, uh, and energy connectivity is one of them. And I'll uh, give some, some basic numbers for you know, all, all of uh, you in the audience to understand. Moldova imports 100% of its gas consumption, and all the imports comes from Russia Federation via Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and as you can guess, the pipes were built uh, just one way. I mean, it, it has just, uh, it, it allows for a traffic of gas just one way. Um, in, in the electricity area, uh, Moldova produces just 20% of its uh, consumption. And all of it, it's like 98% of it, it's, cons it's produced from gas or based on gas. The other 80% comes from uh, mainly from Ukraine and from the breakaway uh, region of Transnistria. So given this critical dependence on these two major energy resources, you can understand yourself how important for the country is the uh, diversification, as the connectivity or the prospect yeah. of, of, of being able to buy its gas and to, to uh, get its electricity <laughs> from other sources. Uh, the plan is just to, I will not bother you with very technical details, but the plan is um, to build a pipeline, a gas pipeline connecting Romania and Moldova. The pipeline is actually built already. Uh, it has been commissioned uh, in 2014. Uh, it's transborder pipe connecting the, the, the city of Yash with the city of Ungen. But as the main ga gas consumption happens in the capital city of Moldova, in Chisinau, it's now very important to build uh, the pipe further, to, to build the supply to the capital city. So that's the plan, uh, basically, that uh, has been uh, luckily supported by our main developmental partners and, and IFIs. So it's a project that is supported, of course, is supported by Romania, but it's also supported by European Investment Bank, by EBRD. Uh, so uh, for us, you know, what's the importance for the country? It's basic national security. It's uh, energy resource diversification, and and frankly, to put it in in a bit of connection with the first panel. Due to the DCFTA, Moldova has now 70% of its export going to EU countries. And DCFTA and this opportunity to export to Europe has been probably the best answer mm -hmm. to some uh, politically driven product embargoes that we've experienced from some of our uh, uh, neighbors or, or neighboring countries. So. In this terms, being able to get our supply and our energy supply from a different source uh, provides, first of all, uh, the opportunity to have this predictability of contract, availability of supply, and continuity. So that's in brief how important this is uh, for the country. Uh, and uh, you know, if you if you want, that's the connection. Uh, when, when the country is selling 70% of its exports to EU, it would be uh, logical to try to diversify its energy resources mm -hmm. as well until we become greener and until we, we can count more on, on, on uh, some other resources. Yeah, no, no, I mean, this is r truly remarkable what Moldova has done. I remember in 2000, only 10% of Moldova's exports then went to the European Union, which was very much because of protectionism against agricultural produce. And at that time, two thirds of, you, of Moldova's uh, exports were uh, agricultural products. 
So uh, Moldova has really turned uh, itself uh, around qu quite uh, remarkably and happy to hear that that is uh, also working in the energy area. Let me then turn to Minister uh, Vasil uh, Hudak. You were uh, Slovak uh, uh, Minister of Economy right. and now you have uh, been at the uh, management of the Europe European Investment Bank um, for uh, two and a half uh, uh, years. And when I'm operating in these countries, I always ask for more money from the European Investment Bank <laughs> because that is the, the big source of funding that uh, is available. So my first question to you is how much more can you do for the, uh, <coughs> these uh, European neighborhood countries or the Eastern uh, Partnership? And what are your priorities, in, in particular, in the area of energy? Please. Thank you. Thank you. Good question. <coughs> Before I go to the question, I just want to, I'm looking at this Norwegian <laughs> team here, and want to express really the appreciation for being with us and being part of, big part of the, of the audience. Um, I remember I was, uh, three years ago I was in Kirkenes, in the very <laughs> north of uh, Norway, and uh, it's also a big naval base of uh, Norwegian army and uh, uh, it was about minus 20 degrees and, and, I, and I saw the <laughs> army soldiers running in shorts in, <laughs> in the streets of Kirkenes. so I know that the army is very strong and very disciplined and good so uh, good to see this discipline also here. Um, to your qu question, um, uh, European Union Bank is the bank of the European Union so we are act actually owned by 28 member states of the European Union so, so far 28, uh, after Brexit <laughs> 27. Um, it is also a large international financial institution. Uh, last year we uh, invested into the projects uh, in the overall amount of around 74 billion euro. Uh, around 10% of this, uh, because we're created primarily for the European Union, and the Europe EU economies, but about 10% of this amount, so around 8 billion is going outside of the European Union. Uh, when it comes to the Eastern Neighborhood, uh, during the last 10 years of, uh, uh, of the existence of Eastern Neighborhood as a formalized group, since 2009, uh, we have invested in the region around 9 billion euro. Uh, out of this 9 billion euro, uh, about 20% went to energy and energy projects, especially to renewable energy, to improving energy efficiency and energy infrastructure around 25% to basic infrastructure like transport, highways, uh, rail railroads and so on, and also a, a big amount for support of small, small and medium enterprises. Uh, so for us this is an important region. Uh, we follow and we work very closely with the European Commission, uh, in this case especially DG Near, and uh, great, great to have my compatriot <laughs> <laughs> Katarina, Katarina Maternova here and also schoolmate <laughs> some, some years ago. <laughs> Uh, from the uh, Slovak University, uh, uh, but we, we work very closely with the European Commission because mm -hmm. we are de facto a financial arm of the, of the European Union and uh, obviously we follow the main philosophy of the EU towards the Eastern Neighbourhood and neighbourhoods in general uh, to expand the prosperity and stability to this area and also to integrate closer these countries to the, to the EU. Now y your question, good question, which is how can we provide more and, and uh, what would be needed for this? Uh, I think it's uh, basically as in market economy, you have to have a supply and you have to have a de demand. Um, on the supply side, uh, we invest uh, money which we raise on the international markets. Uh, so we issue each year bonds, around 50 to 55 billion euro of uh, bonds of the EIB, which are bought by uh, big institutional players or by the European Central Bank, pension funds and so on. Many of them, one third of them actually in the United States. And we are able to transfer uh, the advantage of financial advantage uh, thanks to the fact that we are a triple A bank. So we can raise cheap money, which we then transfer to the, to the clients. We are a not-for-profit bank, so mm. uh, we don't charge commercial um, commercial rates uh, uh, on, on top, uh, but uh, we transfer most of the financial aid value to the uh, to the clients themselves. So what we need is to preserve the AAA rating status when working in the countries with higher uh, level of risk, uh, which are also countries in the East. Uh, we are utilizing heavily so-called external lending mandate, which is de facto 
as Katarina mentioned already mentioned before, it's a guarantee provided by the EU budget mm -hmm. uh, to allow us to also go to riskier projects. So existence of this uh, uh, guarantee from the EU budget is uh, very very important and essential for us to be able to operate in the in the eastern eastern neighborhood. Also, uh, and it was, that was also already mentioned, obviously you need to have. Uh, um, technical assistance support and technical assistance grants uh, to be able to help and structure projects but also to provide uh, so-called concessional financing, cheaper financing, very mixed grants and, and the uh, uh, repayable, re repayable funds. On the demand side, uh, the key issue is to have projects into which you invest yeah, because the pro projects have to pay back. Um, and uh, we have two categories of clients de facto. One are sovereign governments, so sovereign uh, clients. Uh, there, uh, the key issue in the Eastern neighborhood is uh, so-called fiscal space. Uh, the all these countries, mm -hmm. as, as, as you know, as we know, are under the supervision of International Monetary Fund. Uh, they can allow only certain amount of public debt. And uh, that's why uh, they have to be very careful how much they can borrow from institutions like uh, EIB, World Bank, uh, EBRD, etc. Uh, so uh, there is a limitation, obviously, in terms of the fiscal space which is available. And when we uh, lend to private sector, it's about uh, projects which uh, would be bankable projects, which is not easy to identify. So uh, actually, we are discussing with the European Commission, with uh, countries like uh, like Ukraine or Moldova, um, uh, creating a uh, kind of uh, technical assistance mechanism which would help with structuring of such bankable projects. Mm -hmm. uh, because I think one issue which uh, we haven't been really successful so much in um, Eastern neighborhood is to use the experience of the countries like Slovakia, where I'm coming from, which used to be part of the neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, 20 years ago mm -hmm. we, were, we were a neighborhood of the European Union and uh, then became members of the European Union and uh, we utilized uh, different structures such as uh, JASPER's program, um, uh, ways how the how these countries actually adjusted to the European Union and were able to join. So uh, uh, I think that uh, working in parallel on the supply and demand side uh, would uh, allow us to to do to do more and to be even more active in this partnership than we have been so far. Let me follow up with a few uh, questions here. Mm. Uh, your interest rate, how much is that? On a state project? It, it, it all depends, of course, on uh, the project itself. Uh, so it's not, not to set the rate no as no a VIMF. No, no, uh, no, rate tends to be three, three and a half uh, percent. Uh, 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 no, you said it's very, very much it depends. depends. I mean, well, we have a certain process how we create mm. pricing per project. It's uh, very uh, but, but, but it's, uh, but it's, it's, it's lower uh, because, as I said, uh, if, if, you, if you have a structure of pricing where you start with the cost of funding, yeah, yeah. for how much you borrow the money, then you have some risk pr pricing on top of these, and then uh, to recover your administration cost. Uh, these are basically the components. As I mentioned, we don't put the, the, the commercial, the, the profit mm -hmm. element on top of this. So that's why we can be cheaper than, than uh, usual commercial banks. And you have country caps, how much you're allowed to uh, provide to certain countries, or do you take the CIS as a region as a whole? For us, it's a region. As I mentioned, uh, one major limitation is the size of the uh, so-called external lending mandate. It means mm. how much guarantee we can get and use from the from the EU budget. Uh, but uh, we also have projects which uh, are not utilizing the guarantee itself, where we can uh, lend directly to the uh, to to the clients in in the region, especially from private sector, without such gar guarantee. So it's about the quality of projects and uh, quality of the counterparts as well as as well as uh, the amount of guarantee. I think one issue which I will mention is that uh, I think one frustration which I see in Eastern Europe and Eastern neighborhood is that uh, unfortunately there are not enough uh, private investors, uh, European companies mm. which would invest into, into these countries. And uh, we see many situations uh, in Ukraine, in Georgia, other countries where we actually issue or fund projects, infrastructural projects for building highways, uh, uh, tunnels, whatever, railways, and uh, we see uh, Chinese or Turkish companies and so on winning the contracts. So um, uh, we do need to get much more private sector engagement from the European side. Yeah, but it's uh, in these cases where it's not 
much of private investment that one needs uh, these uh, public institutions Correct. as EIB and for that matter uh, IFC. Mm. So I would then like to turn to uh, uh, Rolf uh, Bandt, who's uh, representing the International Financial Corporation, which is the private <coughs> sector arm of, uh, of, 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 of the World Bank. And you work as a global practice manager for uh, finance, competitive and innovation mm -hmm. for the whole region, uh, that is uh, Europe and, and uh, uh, Central Asia. Exactly. And um, what do you see as the big priorities for IFC? And what is it that you would really like uh, to accomplish in these uh, uh, Eastern Partnership uh, uh, countries? Okay, I would thanks. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> to speak. I would like to ask the audience three questions. <laughs> <laughs> let's see if you can get it right. And it's, it's just late. So if I give another speech, you'll fall asleep. So I have to do something. <laughs> so the first question: What is the amount of development aid? that goes that the global companies provide countries to the developing world. So it's a figure. It's so development aid, what is the size of development aid annually? Is it 1 billion, 10 billion, 100 billion, 1 trillion? So I'm giving you really a sense. So you just have to tell me what's the dimension. Hard to say, no. Okay, this is just so. I can tell you the figure. It's 135 billion. So the second question is then, what is the amount of Remittances, uh, direct investment from EIB, e World Bank, IFC. How much does the world globally invest into developing countries? So I can give you the same question. Is it you know, 100, 100 million? At least somebody has the, the, the courage. Any <laughs> other question? Any other pause? Somebody wants to make an educated or perhaps just a guess? So nobody, okay, fair enough, it's late. So the figure is one trillion annually. The next, so the last figure is, so how much is actually the, the financing needs for, for investment globally? Is it also one trillion? Or is it more? More. 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 It's much, much more. So the, the honest answer is this, it's, it's 4.5 trillion annually. That means it doesn't matter how much we collectively, the World Bank, EIB, EBRD, IFC, put them all together and we still are unable actually to finance more than perhaps 30% of the world's development investment needs. Um, so the, so if one of the key questions really for me, the key challenge for me is what we call maximizing finance to, for development or, or simplistically put, how can we, and we know the world capital markets are extremely liquid. So the, the ever since 2008 there's been, as you said, a dearth actually of investment opportunities. So how can we actually use our knowledge, our skills of markets? How can we use that actually to create those investment opportunities so we can lever those trillions of dollars which have become much, much more important than any kind of official development aid? So this is the approach we call financing for development, creating the market so that we allow the private sector to invest. So it's not we have to do everything anymore, but actually the private sector takes over. And that is a really tricky thing because on the one hand, we already know it's hard to find development pro projects that are investment grade, investment worthy. And so we have to come up with new ideas and ways of doing this. The project that uh, you had mentioned, Ukrainian Deficiency Fund, and need to, so Katerina has gone out of the room, but Barbara's still here. And we <laughs> negotiated this two years, was now trying to do a very innovative approach. Instead of IFC financing, we have to finance something like 60 billion dollars worth of retrofits of buildings in Ukraine. And it's highly needed. I mean, if you live in Ukraine, one of the classical multi-story building flats, it's cold in the winter, and especially the further you are away from the heating st station, the colder it is. Um, and you don't really have the money, uh, but you know it's really something you have to do. Your building is uh, deteriorating. So to create the incentives, the European Union is now giving partial grants. These will be channeled through the also, and the Ukrainian government is also providing partial grants. So we're telling homeowners, we will give you 40% of the costs, and you, if you put in a weather 5%, then you can get the money from a private sector bank. And we know that homeowners associations are extremely credit worthy because they're a collection of 100 families, 100 units. They pay regularly because they don't want to kick out. But they're fantastic borrowers, but banks doesn't know it. So by providing the partial grants, the banks feel happy the banks provide the co-financing, suddenly we're able to do things that previously weren't um, able or weren't possible. 
So this approach of maximizing finance development is perhaps, let's say, the biggest key for me. It fits into connectivity in the sense, how do you connect the public sector with the private sector, which is perhaps one of the biggest challenges. Um, to stick with Ukraine, what are the other, for me, uh, but this is also true for Romania with the entire Eastern Partnership, is, um, and to stick with finance still, is uh, banking. So the, I can, I'm not gonna ask questions anymore. So one of the two other nice um, figures are probably 100% of Ukrainians or Georgians or Azeris have a mobile phone. But the second question is how many of them have a bank account? And the question you go down to like 30%. And so how is that's a fantastic opportunity. How can we help these countries to introduce mobile banking, which will then bypass all the problems we have in banking, create new banks, and actually bring down the transaction costs of the population and make it easier actually to bank. We take it for granted, uh, but in those countries it's still missing. So a completely different approach, doesn't cost a lot of money, but actually can have huge impact in terms of development. Can I stop there? Yeah, no, I think that this is a very interesting idea. I worked in uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan 20 years ago, and there they had old lines, uh, telephone lines, and uh, then all of a sudden they realized that it was much better to have mobile phones, that uh, uh, wire lines were com uh, completely useless, and you're uh, applying the same idea when it comes to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, bank uh, banking. Exactly. So this is very much how one is, and I know in Ukraine this is happening now. There is a very popular uh, 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 mobile ba uh, uh, bank that is entirely internet and mobile internet. Uh, I would like to open up to the floor, uh, please, and introduce yourself with uh, uh, a name and institution. Yeah, Mike, Mike over there. Mike is coming, Dieter. <laughs> Uh, so far, we have been uh, debating um, uh, the Eastern Partnership in terms of economic development, finances, investment, all of that. Very important. But there's also a political dimension. There's a dimension of influence, particularly in the case of Russia. And you can see that in Ukraine. You can see it in Belarus. You see it in Armenia. Uh, I want to add China. And with the Belt and Road Initiative, <laughs> You will see, of course, an enormous influence emerging for China. And my question to you is, to what degree is the Russian and Chinese influence limiting progress of the Eastern Partnership, meaning, of course, the partnership with the EU? I think that's a critical question we need to ask. Thank you. Thank you. Good question, uh, uh, Christina and Yuri. Do you feel like our, our relations with Russia is clear. We have war, war with Russia, and Russia is trying to influence the situation in Ukraine for the last 20 years. And for the last uh, three years, we are in active war with Russia. Regarding China, we have projects with, with Chinese companies, purest commercial uh, pro projects in mortgage market, in infrastructure. Uh, we have already implemented a few projects. But priority for us is still uh, to, to focus on the EU, on uh, cooperation with uh, European inter uh, International Investment Bank, sorry, with EBRD, with Chinese, our uh, uh, private companies uh, have been developing a few projects. And frankly, uh, frankly, I see no huge competition in the area of infrastructure, energy from the side of Chinese companies. Um, we are not limited. We are not limited. It's, it's competition, you know, but. Uh, still, it's more on uh, level uh, relations between Chinese private companies and our private companies. Christina? Uh, I think my answer will be very much along the same lines. For Moldova, uh, look, our political vector is very clear to, towards the West and towards the European Union. As a small country, the best economic policy that we can promote is to deal on commercial terms with all uh, good partners. So, uh, yes, we do have now some discussions with, with Chinese investors for certain infrastructure projects. Um, you know, great if they will be implementing them well. So, uh, 
but it's all on commercial terms and I would not say that uh, you know we feel such a uh, interference or la, la, la. yeah at least from China Let, let's put it this way I think uh, you, you put both in the same question I think I would treat the answer in an answer differently <laughs> the, the, yeah, Russia, yes, but Russia yeah. and China. I mean, to add on, do you have yeah. to, to? It depends on the region. So I don't think for the Eastern Europe partnership it's that relevant. But if you go to Central Asia, or if you go to, uh, to the, if, or especially to Africa, you will feel the influence of China much, much more, uh, much different, much more prevalent. Please, Please. I, I think uh, relations with Russia are also very much um, kind of country mm -hmm. Specific, uh, obviously, Belarus uh, would have different relations than uh, Ukraine. Uh, it's given by history, by the geographic location, etc. Or Armenia would have different than, than, than Georgia. So uh, I would not ge uh, generalize, but uh, um, that's uh, that's the situation. <coughs> in terms of China, it's a new Im emerging power in the in the whole Eurasian U Eurasian space. Mm, I mean, looking at the situation from the perspective of the countries of Eastern neighborhood. One thing which is different from countries which joined EU later, like Slovakia, is that uh, we had a clear perspective of EU membership. There was a clear timing, there was a clear process, negotiating of the acquis communautaire, different uh, files, etc. And obviously it cre created a momentum for these countries to move quickly along the reforms and so on. Uh, the countries of Eastern Partnership, unfortunately, don't have such clear date or a clear perspective. There is a lot of discussion about the uh, integration, but uh, the reality of the political situation in the inside the European Union is that uh, nobody would tell Ukraine or Moldova, whoever, that you will become member of the EU on such and such date. And obviously this creates uh, different dynamics in the countries themselves and in the, in the whole region. So they have to, and I think it's natural, that they are looking for other partners for different projects and. China is, is one of those, they are very active, they have enough capital to deploy, uh, they have a relatively clear strate strategy through the one belt, one road approach. And uh, I think it's a challenge for, for Europe, for the European Union, because if we don't uh, mobilize ourselves, if we don't become uh, active in this area, we may actually gradually find ourselves to be, to be on the sidelines of uh, Chinese investors and, uh, and, and, and Chinese money. So, so I think it's a competition, maybe a, a useful competition, uh, because uh, I think competition is, is fine. It's, uh, it's as you both mentioned, it's about uh, uh, commercial pro projects and about business. And, and it's also and diversification. And it's also <laughs> diversification. So um, I, I, don't, I don't take it as, a, yeah, as something which is, which is bad. But the fact is that uh, Europe has to, has to take it seriously. And it's not only uh, neighborhood. I mean, we see what uh, Ch Chinese money is doing inside the European Union. We are recently inside the EIB, we were uh, discussing, for example, investments in the uh, Pireu, port of Piraeus in Greece, which actually is owned by Chinese, mm -hmm. which was privatized uh, or concessionist to the Chinese company. So uh, this is an uh, issue which uh, EU has to tackle not only for neighborhood, but uh, I would say globally. Let me just add a, a, a couple of effects uh, with uh, regard to Ukraine and China that I find fascinating. U Ukraine has now overtaken the U.S. as the biggest exporter of corn to China. Uh, Ukraine is the second biggest uh, arms exporter to China after Russia. And China has voted for uh, all uh, IMF program for uh, Ukraine, while Russia has voted against or abstained on the, those votes. So uh, China is very careful not to stand with Russia against Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And this is also true of uh, uh, the other countries. I saw some hand down there. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon. Alex Sanchez, I'm an analyst here in Washington. A question about Moldova. From what I understand, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development has bought around 41% of a Moldovan bank called Agroin Bank. And then a Bulgarian holdings company, Dovari Invest, has bought about 63% of uh, Malt in Convank, if I'm correct. Uh, what do you think about these deals? And what do you think about how the Eastern Partnership has made Moldova more attractive to European extra and extra-regional investors? Thank you. Christina. So 
I uh, guess it's a question related directly to my uh, professional responsibility as a central banker. Uh, as I mentioned at the very beginning of my intervention, um, we've done, uh, we, we lived through and, and drove a full turnaround of the banking sector. And primarily uh, addressing the cause of the banking crisis that happened in Moldova, the transparency and the quality of the shareholders of the banks. The two banks that you've mentioned are the largest two banks in the country, uh, Moldova Agrain Bank with around 27, 30% uh, market share on different parameters, and uh, uh, Moldincom Bank with about 20% uh, market share. Uh, so uh, the, the, the importance was really to create an environment and create a push to, to drive the unfit shareholders out of the system and to, to try to attract uh, quality <laughs> shareholders into the system. Uh, this is not an easy uh, project. This is not an easy task. And for anyone that is uh, knowledgeable about the, uh, let's say, market or regional market, there is not I would not say that there is an investment hype and there are too ba many banking investors or too many banking groups looking for uh, purchasing opportunities in these countries. So I would say that um, given the uh, regional conditions, given the country conditions, we've succeeded to create an environment in which uh, investors uh, mostly European investors, but also multinationals and, and, and development banks uh, have uh, been attracted to the banking sector of Moldova. And uh, for, for the central bank, uh, you know, that we create the rule, we've approved these investors, welcomed them to the system, and now it's their task to develop the system further on. Thank you very much. I see one last question here, and then we need to uh, draw it uh, to, to an end. Please. Thank you, Melissa Hirsch. And I think I just want to dovetail on the investment screening question related to China. But um, in an effort to de-risk a lot of the projects in terms of connectivity, whether it's digital, transport, or energy, um, how much consideration is actually being given to the borrower's level of cyber maturity? as well as to the potential projects level of cyber maturity. Yeah, can you repeat the last? Uh, I couldn't uh, hear it myself. Is it on? Cyber it's about the level uh, of. Hold the mic uh, closer to your mouth. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's about the level of cyber maturity related to your investment decisions. So cyber in maturity. Yeah, in order to de-risk your projects. Are you actually examining the level of cybersecurity that the borrower has and or that the project itself has in these particularly um, high risk, high consequence areas? Well, you Not our area of expertise, it seems to be. Yeah. So I fear that. Case by case, I think, yes. Yeah. I mean, obviously, there, uh, there is a heavy IT component in the project itself. Uh, then uh, cybersecurity would be something which you would you would consider. What um, was the case between uh, during our cooperation and projects we implemented with EIB and other AFIs? Uh, we didn't uh, uh, examine the issue of cybersecurity. Maybe in the future, uh, when we will attract investors to our, for example, private bank, private bank is the largest one. It has very uh, developed IT infrastructure. Maybe we will focus uh, on this issue. More as a joke. Do you op do you work for a hacking company? <laughs> <laughs> or IT? <laughs> Katarina, would you say some words at the end? No, I think I did that. You think you did that already? Yeah. Then I would just. <laughs> there is, but you don't have to. <laughs> yeah. I would like then to thank uh, the panel very much, and I would also like to thank the audience. Och som svensk vill jag särskilt tacka den stora norska delegationen här. Thank you.